D converted man here. Welcome to my analysis of why atheism is nonsense. Part 3. They're confused about the definition of atheism. What's interesting about part 3 is it has no argumentation. Yes, I know that was what was interesting with part 1 and part 2, but it continues to be interesting. Moving on, let's look at what this video is saying. A equals no, theos equals God, ergo, atheos, no God, hence, atheism, belief in no God. But you see, fake atheists have been trying to redefine atheism to mean a lack of belief in God. Because, as we all know, adding in lack of belief completely changes it from belief in no God. It totally changes that definition completely, right? We all know that. No? No, some of you are saying no out there, I think. Okay, but hear me out. This is Deconverted Man, your friend, your friendly YouTuber guy thing that I am. I do logic, that's what I love. Let's be objective about this. If we are changing the word even slightly, there's still potential for equivocation. I know it's just a modifier of a couple of words, maybe it's to try to clarify, but it could be seen as equivocation, and that's a justified argumentation against it. If in a debate I say atheist, and I mean lack of belief in a god, and you say atheist, and you mean belief in no god, we might have an issue there without even realizing it because we mean different things. So it's important for us to both agree upon the definition going into that debate. Before the debate even starts, it's important for us to come to an agreement on what we mean by this word. We need to negotiate what we're going to mean by this word. Maybe neither one of us really wants to use the word in the dictionary sense. Maybe we want to retain our own version of the word for whatever reason. So we're going to have to agree for sake of this debate that we're going to have an atheist 1 and an atheist 2 or an A1 and an A2. And that will allow the audience to know what I mean by atheist is this. So we're going to call that A1 from now on. And then the other opponent would say, okay, what I mean by atheist is this. And we're going to call that A2 from now on. And the debate would go forward. Of course, I would be the one saying A1 because that's how steak is done. And I want to win the debate and eat some yummy steak. But at any rate, that's how it would go. So if there was a problem, it's easily resolved. However, I do have an issue with fake atheists. Fake atheists? Would that mean that they're not really an atheist, which would mean they're actually a theist? How do you know they're fake? How did you get to that conclusion? Are they fake because they are trying to define atheism in a new way? Why does that make them fake? Is this a redux of no true Scotsman fallacy just backwards now? You're not a true atheist if you say what atheism really means or if you change its definition. Now you're a fake atheist somehow? How does that work? There's too many potential fallacies for me to grant the idea of fake atheists there. So I'm going to just ignore that you said fake atheists and just drop that word fake and say atheists sometimes say this. And I would say, yeah, you're right. Sometimes they do. I've probably said it once or twice. I don't know that I have, but I might have. Now, here is a good argumentation. Using scholarly dictionaries, dictionaries that we would all agree upon are good sources for definitions, to back up the claim that some atheists are doing this thing where they change the definition of atheism to mean something different, even slightly different than what it means in the dictionary. Okay, so let me help you out here. Your first premise cannot be fake atheist. We've got to get rid of that because that's nonsense. It's going to open up a can of worms, and I'm going to have to be skeptical of your conclusions. So your first premise, I'm going to rewrite it for you. You can thank me later. Your first premise is some atheists redefine atheism according to these dictionaries, and then you pull out those dictionaries and say, see, here's the definition. They're redefining it. Whether it's slightly or extraordinarily, they're still redefining it. That's Premise one. Premise two is fill in the blank. I 
not sure what premise two would be or, or three or however many more premises. But then you would have your following premises and then your conclusion would be, therefore, atheism is nonsense. Okay, so we've got the first premise down. Where's the rest of the premises? Let's see if he's got any. But first, we're going to have to deal with this false appeal to the wrong authority. Charles Darwin was an authority on evolution. I'll give him that. On atheism, maybe, maybe not. He might have considered himself an atheist. He might not have. Doesn't matter. And it, even if he did think of himself as an atheist, it doesn't matter what he wrote about it. He is not speaking for all atheists. He can only speak for himself. Oh, and then you're going to follow it with another appeal to the the wrong authority here. This is essentially an appeal to novelty. Hitchens is, and or was, famous for debating theism. He was a prominent, well-spoken, outspoken atheist. He argued against God in every which way that he could do that, and he did debate Craig twice. Hitchens says in this debate, nor does it matter what Craig says in this debate. It doesn't matter who wins or loses this debate. On every single ground, logically, coherently, he could lose it on a technical level, and it would not matter because Hitchens does not and cannot represent all atheists or atheism everywhere. Cannot do that. I don't think he would have done it even if he could have done it, and he can't do it. No one person can represent all of atheists or atheism. Your point here could have been made to say some atheists, following from premise one, some atheists commit this fallacy of potential equivocation. Here's proof that some atheists will do that using these definitions. Here is an atheist that is doing it right here. I have proven my point. That is my sub-conclusion. Hitchens is an atheist that did this potential equivocation, meaning Hitchens did do this equivocation. I have at least one example of an atheist who did this equivocation. Great. So you have your true premises and you have a sub-conclusion. Hear it? Premise 1, 2, and the conclusion is all co coherent. So what? Where does this argument get us other than to show that some atheists have this issue? So what? Where's your argument that shows that atheism is nonsense? Have that Hitchens screwed up according to one atheist website. Okay. Yeah. So what's your point? Well, it looks like we're not going to get an answer to that question. Instead, we're going to get more cherry-picked quotes from authority figures who I could care less about because quoting and quote mining philosophers, experts, doesn't matter. I don't care what Scott, whatever his last name is, said. Who cares? So what? How does this help? This isn't like a reference to strengthen your argument, in which case it would not be fallacious. This is made in place of an argument. But I'll analyze what Scott here says. Scott says that the reason adults disbelieve in Santa is not because there is no good reason to think that Santa exists, but because there are good reasons to think that Santa does not exist. I'll get back to that in a moment. Scott has been unable to find a good argument which places differential burdens of proof on theists and atheists. Well, actually, there's a good reason that he hasn't found that yet, but I'll get to that in a moment. And finally, he says that from his view, there's no justification for the current atheistic rage in the absence of anthropological apologetics. Okay, so I would ask Scott to provide me with what research he conducted to show that adults do not believe in Santa Claus for the reasons that he is suggesting here. You got that research there, Scott, or he's just claiming special knowledge? But Scott, the reason why you haven't been able to find a good argument that has a differential between these two is because it's an asymmetrical dialogue exchange. It isn't a symmetrical dialogue exchange. You want a symmetrical one. You're probably not going to find one. However, 
there are some arguments out there that would fit in the context of a symmetrical dialogue between atheist and theist. If you just want to find an argument where two people present that, I guess we can find you one or make one ourselves, but just because you haven't found one doesn't mean there's one out there. The whole good argument part, I don't know what you mean by that, if you mean logically coherent argument, then I would think you were wrong because there's plenty of logically coherent arguments out there against theism and for naturalism. There's maybe one positive for theism that I haven't found, but it could exist. It might be out there. Just because I haven't found it doesn't mean it's not out there. And the whole no justification for rage thing, meh, doesn't really matter. Sure, there's justification, and even if there wasn't justification, so what? We can be upset if we want to be upset. Big deal. Who cares? Doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. So, Scott's not doing very good for you arguing for your case, and your case isn't being argued for here. You're just saying what Scott said. That's not an argument. And let's just cherry pick two more atheist philosophers because they're atheists and so therefore they speak for all atheists. No, but even so, actually what they're saying here is very honest and very humble. To admit that you could be wrong is, I think, one of the highest levels that we can get to as humans. To say, this is what I think, but I could be wrong. I could be completely wrong, and therefore I leave myself open to the possibilities. But why admit that you're wrong when you can just pretend to be right? What's the next little bit here? Okay, so we're going to finish with an irrelevancy. All these things, some of which are inanimate, some of which are alive, but do not have consciousness, at least not in the human sense as far as we know, do not believe in God, nor would they believe in anything. In fact, they cannot believe at all because they do not have consciousness. So, good job on irrelevancy and red herring simultaneously. Wow, that that's pretty impressive. Where's your argument? Oh, right, in the beginning of this video I said you didn't have one, and you don't have one. So, how many logical fallacies did you perform? At least three. I didn't put up my counter today, but it was at least three. The argument, it's not even an argument, would look something like this. Some atheists sometimes equivocate what atheism means with a slightly different version of atheism. And because some atheists sometimes do that, that means that all of atheism is nonsense. Did, did I get that right? Is that pretty much what the argument looks like? Yeah, I think that that's what it would have to be. So, maybe you do have an argument in this video. Uh, be it one with logical fallacies, which means that unless and until you give us a logically coherent argument, which you haven't done, we have to continue to be skeptical of your conclusions.